want to thank President Weiss and the Board of Trustees for inviting me to come back to Leslie for this amazing honor. I'm humbled. I remember sitting at my own graduation from Leslie, getting my master's degree. In 2007, I had a granola bar hidden in the sleeve of my funny gown, and I was excited to start what I imagined to be my grown-up life. And uh, 10 years later, I haven't really felt, figured out what it means to be a grown-up, but I'm really honored to return here and have the opportunity to speak with you. One night in the summer of 2010, I found myself standing on the edge of a cliff somewhere in Utah. The day's heat had broken and the night was clear. Above me, there were millions of stars, and down below me lay darkness and uncertainty. My legs trembled, and I willed myself to jump. A few days earlier, I had met with a group of educators uh, from all over the country on the bank of the Colorado River to set off on a week-long whitewater rafting trip. We'd signed waiver forms, agreeing that were we to meet some terrible end in the week to come, we would release our guides from all responsibility. And I'd signed up for the trip because although I was scared of water and didn't know how to swim, I figured it was a sort of experience I wouldn't get the chance to do again anytime soon and I should probably take advantage of it. But now, standing at the edge of a cliff in the darkness, wearing a harness and sweating underneath a helmet that was too loose, I was having regrets about my choices. So the guide said to me, go ahead and just step backwards off the edge of the cliff. He was a crunchy, bearded man. Uh, he liked to wake up early and do yoga in the wilderness. And he said to me, trust the ropes. Trust the ropes. So I clutched at the ropes, connecting my harness to the edge of the cliff, and I peered back over my shoulder into the abyss. My colleagues, the other teachers, they'd already made their way over the edge, and they waited down below somewhere. Their voices floated up toward me, punctuated by laughter. While they had jumped off the edge, I'd hung back until I couldn't put off the inevitable any longer. Certainly, if I'd wanted to, I could have told the guides that I didn't want to do it, that I'd rather hike back down into the valley, my headlamp attracting gnats and leaving a divot in my forehead, you know, a mark of my shame and cowardice. But I was too stubborn for that. I was determined to prove that I could do this. So at the top of the cliff, everything was quiet and still. I shuffled backwards, and I fell. Something happened. There was a loose rock under my foot. I made a misstep, and I lost my footing. I slipped off the edge of the cliff. I swung wide out over the valley until the rope caught me, and I dangled there, screaming, my headlamp bouncing crazily off the cliff face. You're OK, the guide called over the edge. The ropes have you. I have you. Down below, my colleagues grew quiet. Well, I thought, this is it. This is where I die, here on a cliff in the middle of nowhere in Utah with people I've basically just met wearing a headlamp. This is the end. And maybe some of you out there are more adventuresome than I am. And you're sitting there and you're rewinding the details of this story and you're thinking, wait, didn't she say she had on a safety harness and, and ropes? What's the big deal, right? Maybe you're thinking I'm being melodramatic. You're thinking, just jump so I can get my diploma. Okay, but here's the thing, go with me. Every year, my entire school, or a high school, we go on a three-day trip to a camp in New Hampshire called Camp Maravista. It's run by the American Youth Foundation, and it's an amazing place where really skillful, kind educators help our kids challenge their own notions of what they're capable of. One of the activities that the Maravista staff members sometimes do with us on the first day of our trip has to do with the concept of comfort zones. So they take us into a clearing in the woods, and they use a stick to draw three concentric circles in the dirt. And the center circle, they tell us, represents our comfort zone. So we all clump together in the middle of it, and we think about times that we feel comfortable. At home, watching TV, hanging out with our friends, doing something we're really, really good at. Being in our comfort zone feels good. It's, um, you know, comfortable. But staying in the comfort zone doesn't exactly push us. We're not going to learn much in the comfort zone. We're not going to grow. So that second circle, the one in the middle, that's called the growth zone. 
that's where we can safely push ourselves to try something new or challenging. We're able to learn and grow there. And the outer circle, that's called the danger zone. When we go into the danger zone, we're not going to learn anything. We go into that lizard brain, fight or flight, we panic, we sweat, we become irrational, like thinking we will meet an untimely end uh, on the cliff face in Utah, even though we're strapped into a safety harness being controlled by a gentle hippie. So this is where things get tricky. Things that are in my danger zone, like slipping off the edge of that cliff, are in other folks' comfort zones. And things that are in my growth zone, like standing up here in front of you with this hat on, would send other people screaming away. Our zones are completely subjective, and they're based on our own biases and experiences. And they change. They change all the time. One of the big points of taking our kids on these annual trips to Camp Mara Vista is to help them expand their comfort zones. When city kids hike through the woods at night for the first time in their lives, listening to these nighttime forest noises and seeing stars sprayed across the sky, they, they hang on to each other and hiss, it's too quiet here. And then the next year, they look forward to that night hike. Their comfort zones expand. So back to the cliff. Eventually, what cleared the fog of panic was the voices of my colleagues floating up at me through the darkness at the bottom of the valley. You can do it, they called out. We're waiting for you. I clutched the ropes, white knuckled, as the guide belayed me down. And when my feet touched the red valley dirt at the bottom, I cried with relief as my fellow teachers tackled me with hugs. And I took that experience and I moved it from the danger zone into the growth zone. Conquering that blind descent taught me about the power of community and the way that adversity can bring people together. It reminded me that it's OK to be vulnerable in the service of learning something new. In my life, I've found myself at the edges of cliffs like that one again and again, staring down into an uncertain future, trying to decide if I would be able to face down my fears and grow. Sitting where you are now, I was at the edge of a cliff. When I started a new job, when I moved to a new city, even recently when I accepted the honor of being named Teacher of the Year, those were all cliffs. And often in those moments, what has sent me from the growth zone into the danger zone, into that place of paralysis, has been my own imposter syndrome. Have you heard of imposter syndrome? It's the sense that you're a fraud, that you're forever on the edge of being found out and exposed, laughed out of whatever place you're in. It's the anxiety that eats at you when you achieve great things and whispers in your ear, everyone you know is smarter than you. It's the sense you get that someone is watching you live your life, rating you, and determining that, yes, you are failing at this adulthood thing. I only recently learned that imposter syndrome has a name and that other people experience it too. And it's been a great relief to me to know that actually a lot of us are battling these demons that tell us we are failures and we're not good enough. But you all, sitting here, eagerly awaiting your diplomas, I know, we'll get there, you have achieved something incredible. You've worked hard to get here and you deserve all the congratulations that you'll hear today. But of course, as much as this is an end, it's also a beginning. From here, you're going to go out into the world and you're going to do great work. You'll be teachers, you'll be biologists, you'll be counselors. You'll uplift other people and you'll fulfill your visions of the world. You will engineer change. But if you and I and all of us are to achieve our full potential, if we are to unlock our own greatness, we have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. We have to stare down our imposter syndrome. We won't ever learn and we won't ever grow if we hang out in our comfort zones for the rest of our lives. A teacher I admire named Tom Rademacher recently said to me, if the goals you set for yourself don't make you uncomfortable, then they are the wrong goals. As you do this good work in the world, you will find yourself at the edges of cliffs again and again. Sometimes you'll be the one scrambling up the mountain, eager to jump off the edge into the unknown and ready for the adventure. Sometimes you'll be me, waiting at the edge for someone to show mercy and save you. Sometimes you'll be worried for no reason, and sometimes you'll fall. But remember in those moments that you've been here before. Everything you've done so far has been in the service of expanding your comfort zone. You are not an imposter of yourself. You are you. You are amazing, and you have what it takes to create the world you want. 
So allow yourself to learn from what happens at the edges of your cliffs. Learn that you will recover if you fall. Learn to trust the ropes and find your support systems, both the people who hold you up and those who have gone over the edge before you. Learn that you are stronger and more capable than you think. Learn that the only way that you can lose is if you surrender to the voices that tell you you're not good enough. And then step into the darkness and conquer it. Congratulations again.